Super Friends is the animated equivalent of The Andy Griffith Show. Super Friends was wholesome, long-running, and an undeniable icon of Americana. And it's a series everyone knows about, even if they were born decades after the show ended. But in 1984, after 10 years on TV, the Super Friends took on superpowers. <laughs> Super Friends debuted in 1973 and acted as a gateway for younger children to become familiar with the DC Comics Justice League of America and its starting lineup of superheroes. While children's television was highly regulated during this period, the ubiquitous popularity of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman in other mediums, such as comics and Mego toys, meant that Super Friends, while not directly merchandised, allowed kids to recognize their favorite heroes in other products on store shelves. Because of the heavily regulated content, there was none of the person-to-person -person violence of the comics. In fact, despite the comics of the 1970s returning to edgier stories, the Super Friends retained Silver Age trappings that would have made Mort Weisinger proud. The plots were outlandish. Frozen Siberians turned into a steaming jungle. The weather's gone wild. The dialogue was bombastic. Uh, uh, and the colors were bright and the tone was optimistic. These heroes were our friends and they would always save the day. In 1978, the series hit a high point with Challenge of the Super Friends, and for the first time, the Justice League was pitted against a pantheon of actual enemies known as the Legion of Doom. The hero roster expanded to include Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman, as well as some diversity-prompted heroes, Samurai, Apache Chief, and Black Vulcan. Well-intentioned in 1978, but now... Awkward. The challenge of the Super Friends is, for many, the apex of the Super Friends legacy. In these adventures, the Wonder Twins bowed out and left it for the real Justice League to battle Lex Luthor and his cadre of criminal masterminds. The starting lineup of heroes in the intro of Challenge of the Super Friends, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman and Robin, The Flash, Aquaman, Green Lantern, Hawkman, would become the template in 1984 for Kenner's Super Powers action figure series. Despite the fact that the Super Friends series had reverted back to the Wonder Twins antics after only one series against the Legion of Doom. While this might have been by chance, Kenner was orienting their Super Powers action figure line with the current DC Comics, rather than the Super Friends aesthetic. And someone at Hanna-Barbera must have taken notice. It's important to remember that up until this point, Hanna-Barbera had firmly planted Super Friends in the path of a younger audience, and this was in keeping with the tone of cartoons of the period, which were very saccharine, harmless yarns. The Super Friends had kid sidekicks, Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog, and in the second Super Friends series, they created the Wonder Twins, kid sidekicks that actually had superpowers and a space monkey. Zan and Jaina were engineered to attract a much younger viewer. But Kenner was having none of that. They were aiming at the age group that actually played with action figures, and Hanna-Barbera must have felt the winds of change. If you're worried at this point that we haven't given the classic Super Friends seasons adequate attention, rest assured Retro Blasting will discuss the pre-Superpower Super Friends in the future with its own video. But what concerns us in this episode is what would be the end of the Super Friends. By now, we were heading into 1984, but Super Friends still looked very much stuck in 1973, with Wonder Woman's bewitched hairdo the icing on the cake. Competing shows like Spider-Man and his amazing friends had a more modern flavor, and they must have known Super Friends was long overdue for a refresh if it was going to capitalize on the release of the Kenner action figures. 
As a result, Hanna-Barbera retitled the series Super Friends The Legendary Superpower Show in 1984 and took some big leaps in a new direction. Good! Now we can interface with our supercomputer and track down its location. They introduced the recurring villain of Darkseid and his minions from Apocalypse, who were bent on ruling the Earth. They also brought Firestorm into the series for the first time, an eager new recruit to join the fight for truth and justice. It means that Firestorm appears to be two people in one. Holy split personalities! In a casting coup, they secured Adam West himself to voice Batman, taking over for Olan Sewell, who had voiced Batman throughout the Super Friends series up until that point. Sewell would be given the role of Professor Stein, one half of Firestorm. Who is this dark side Superman? According to some sources, Hanna-Barbera even attempted to get Linda Carter to voice Wonder Woman, but she wasn't available at the time. In the series, Darkseid has an obsession with Wonder Woman and is desperate for her to become his bride on Apocalypse. With his cohorts Desaad and Kalibak, he makes numerous attempts to kidnap her and destroy the Super Friends. This is quite the departure from the rest of the Super Friends series, in which Wonder Woman is just part of the team. Now she's the object of Darkseid's desire, a heavy course change for the series, and a move that often corners Wonder Woman in a damsel role she previously didn't occupy. Why do you resist? Are you not honored that I have chosen you to be my queen? In between Darkseid's attempts, other baddies hatch their own schemes, and Hanna-Barbera redesigned a number of the villains to reflect the 1980s versions of the characters. Lex Luthor has his power armor, and Brainiac looks like a Terminator. However, the transformation of the series was at best a hesitant one. The heroes are still referred to as the Super Friends. With the Super Friends gone, we must plan our invasion of the Earth. Wonder Woman still has her Elizabeth Montgomery hairdo, and the Wonder Twins remain a part of the cast, running in stark contrast to the more serious conflict with Darkseid. The positive response to the legendary superpower show must have steeled Hanna-Barbera's resolve, though. In 1985, they dropped the Super Friends moniker for the first time in the series' long history, and renamed it the Superpowers Team Galactic Guardians. For what would be the final season, Hanna-Barbera went in whole hog, abandoning the animation style they'd used since 1973, and all but replicated the Jose Garcia Lopez comic artwork in animation. The characters were now in direct comic action combat with Darkseid's robotic minions. But some punches were still being pulled, including the reference to Darkseid's parademons as merely paradrones. Our computer is generating the stargates that are sending the paradrones to their destinations on Earth. Chalk up yet another example of the 1980s preference for human-on-robot violence. Still, the message was clear. The Super Friends wanted to grow up. No more Wonder Twins. Even Black Vulcan and Apache Chief quietly disappeared from the series, replaced by reluctant hero Cyborg who was voiced by none other than the reluctant Ghostbuster himself, Ernie Hudson. Thanks, but uh, no thanks. You guys take the credit for this. I've got to pick up a friend. The animation had improved. The style of the characters had been updated to match the current DC Comics artwork, and the stakes were higher as Darkseid continued his assault on Earth. Wonder Woman never looked better, but she remained Darkseid's fixation. Extra layers of edge found their way into the show for the other heroes as well. For the first time in animation, we are treated to the death of Bruce Wayne's parents in the seminal episode, The Fear, as well as an oddly prophetic entry titled, The Death of Superman. This was the most... human. The experience you have watching Galactic Guardians is a far more comic, authentic one than the earlier Super Friends series. Yes, most of the episodes aren't much more sophisticated than the other shows of the period, but the Scarecrow's scheme in the fear and its effect on Batman is one of the more haunting and serious plots seen in 80s kids animation. Equally impactful is Firestorm's grief in the death of Superman, as he's convinced his negligence killed the Man of Steel. Had Galactic Guardians carried on with another season, we might have seen even more incredible episodes with the way the show was headed. But it wasn't all broad, sunlit uplands with the quality of the series. The writers also started taking shortcuts with Firestorm for the sake of convenience. 
Where originally, Ronald and Professor Stein had to be in the same place to become the superhero, in Galactic Guardians, Ronald has merely to think about Stein, and they become Firestorm wherever he might be. Which, if you think about it, is both risky and a douche move on Ronald's part. What if Stein is in the middle of a class when he's whisked away by Ronald's mind meld? Wouldn't that kind of give away Stein's secret identity? What if he's going 80 on the highway? Or if Stein's on the can? Or macking on a date? Sorry, Professor. You've got to be Firestorm now. We're up all night to get lucky. We're up all night to get lucky. We're up... It's time for a quick change. No, 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 Ro Ronald, 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 no, 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 no! <laughs> Sorry to bother you, Professor. I hate you, Ronald. Wonder Woman also no longer pilots her famous invisible jet. Don't misunderstand me. The jet is still in the show, but Wonder Woman just surfs around on it wherever she goes, like Green Goblin. She's always standing on the wing at Mach 40. How does that jet know when to turn? Or slow down? Or land? You also might notice that all of the heroes carry communicators that have the JLA shield, which stands for Justice League of America, but they're always referred to as the Superpowers Team. Anyone who can capture Lex Luthor single-handedly would be a welcome addition to the Superpowers team. The alignment between Hanna-Barbera and Kenner never found itself in lockstep. It feels as if the animators were just guessing as to what Kenner had planned rather than actually talking to the toy company. And vice versa. For example, Kenner modeled their Hall of Justice playset on Hanna-Barbera's famous edifice, which was incidentally inspired by the Cincinnati Union Terminal building. But in the final Galactic Guardian season, Hanna-Barbera changed the Hall of Justice away from Kenner's animation-inspired design. Hanna-Barbera brought Firestorm into the show the year the toys landed in 1984, but the Firestorm figure didn't appear until the second wave of toys in 1985. Meanwhile, Cyborg, introduced in Galactic Guardians, was the last figure Kenner produced in very small numbers after the series had ended in 1986. Joker and Penguin were prominent figures in the Kenner series, but only made one brief appearance each in the animated series, having never been allowed into the show previously due to licensing issues with Filmation's New Adventures of Batman cartoon. Whereas Darkseid, the main villain of the animated series, and the Superpowers comic miniseries by Jack Kirby, didn't make it into Kenner's toy line until the second year. That's like not having Darth Vader in the first Star Wars figure set. Meanwhile, scores of other DC characters made it into the Kenner figure line that would never be in the series, but the neglect was mutual. Black Vulcan, El Dorado, and Apache Chief were shut out of the figure line. Only Samurai would see his own toy. The sum total of the experience of watching the two superpower seasons is like a little brother that wants to hang out with his big brother at school. Hanna-Barbera really wanted to be associated with the Kenner toys, but it just couldn't grow up fast enough. And speaking of growing up, what about those toys?